You're listening to The Digital Deep Dive, where we tackle the newest trends, strategies, and pain points shaping growth across the digital landscape. From Amazon and D2C to international expansion, join our host and e-commerce leaders across multiple industries for in-depth discussions on how to maximize your brands in the digital arena. Now, here's your host, Aaron Conant. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Digital Deep Dive Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Conant, and today we've got Lauren Leifak on the line here. And uh, Lauren and I have 206 mutual connections <laughs> and yet on LinkedIn, and yet we've only met like one or two previous times, which is pretty crazy uh, as a whole. But uh, we're going to talk about a variety of stuff. Uh, she's at the Digital Shelf Institute. I'm sure uh, a lot of you know of her, have heard about her. Uh, but we want to tackle a little bit around org structure. Uh, but Lauren, I'll kick it over to you if you want to do a brief intro on yourself. Uh, yeah. Digital Shelf Institute. You can even throw in Salsify, all that fun stuff. You got it. Well, thanks for having me, Aaron. And I agree. I can't believe we have never chatted before, but I have to thank the famous Todd Hassenfeld for bringing us together. So That's right. Thanks, uh, Todd. The top rated podcast of all time for the digital oh, wow. dive with Todd there. Yeah. That makes sense. Todd is the best. So if you don't know Todd, also look for him on LinkedIn. But uh, really great to be here. Really excited to have a chat. So quick intro about me. Um, I won't spend too long going back into the deep, deep dark depths of my uh, career path. But I started in e-commerce before e-commerce was a, was important. So this was pre-COVID uh, when people didn't think that e-commerce was a big part of the business. And I still had to convince people that it was important. So I led the digital shelf for North America at Johnson & Johnson Consumer Brands. Uh, and it was a really exciting journey understanding how to build a team, how to build a strategy, how to cross-functionally work throughout the organization and really excite people about the idea of commerce, figure out how to do it well, how to do it efficiently, how to do it agilely. And I, I really learned a lot. Um, and from there, I was able to work at Salsify as a commerce strategist. So I got to work with over 100 different brands uh, building out their e-commerce strategies for the next year, three years, five years, which was just really exciting because every organization does it differently. Everybody's at a different stage. You just really learn so much about the industry, about organizations and, and how they think. So that was a really exciting job. And then I had the awesome opportunity to take over the Digital Shelf Institute. And that is the current role I'm in today. Crazy enough, I've been in it for about two years now. When I started, we were a membership of about 2,000 people, and now we have 6,500 people that are part of the Digital Shelf Institute community. So it's really just an exciting place to be. I, I absolutely love this role because I get to talk to people all the time. I know, Aaron, you have the same sentiment. So. I love people. So I say I'm addicted to people and it's connecting. Uh, it's a good thing. I agree. I love connecting people. I love helping people find out what they need to know and learning more and for me, when I was in my role at J&J, I didn't necessarily know people in the commerce space. And I was in my organization talking to those people. And maybe I had a colleague who knew someone at another company, but I really wanted something like the Digital Shelf Institute that could help me network with other people who were doing my job. And I like to call it e-commerce therapy, where you're like, oh, they said that, or you did that. Well, I did that. And it's a very niche role. So you really need those conversations to to help you figure out what to do next. You um, totally nailed it. That's why like I, when I kicked off Ecom Advisory, you know, before getting acquired into BWG, that was the whole thing was I was at a large OTC pharma company and I was tired of getting sales pitched at every event that I went to and everybody wanted to, you know, set up time to talk and to come into town and take you out to lunch or dinner. I'm like, no, I actually want to just talk to brands. Yes. <laughs> right? Like how many brands can I talk to and all of a sudden that evolved into this cool business model of, you know, we've got close to 9,000 brands that participate now, all networking, knowledge sharing, all free to brands. And we're going to do a uh, hundred dinners this year, which is bonkers. It's all around that. Like, how do we just connect? Uh, it's the best way. It's it's for all of us will succeed and do better if we do that. So yeah. I completely agree with you. And and I love that's why that. we hit it off, Lauren. This is I agree. Awesome. That's why this is going to be such a fun chat. Um, so, yeah, I, so real, real fast, just about DSI and kind of what we focus on. It's really about that connecting people. I like to talk about content, community, and education. So, 
How can we connect people, create that community? We create content. We also have a podcast. Uh, we do research. Oh, what's the um, podcast? Yeah, drop it out there for everybody. Uh, I have no qualms show. promoting it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So Unpacking the Digital Shelf, found where you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple. Uh, so definitely tune into that. We did also have Todd on as a guest. So, I mean, um, yeah. he's he's the, our connector again. Um, but like I said, research content webinars, really just helping people who are in the seat, brands doing the job day to day, do their job better. So really appreciate everybody who is a part of the community and they make my job and my life much easier. So huge shout out to everyone who's a DSI member. Absolutely. Uh, so if we jump in, I'll give everybody a little background on kind of the conversation around org structure. As Laura and I were chatting around, uh, my mom was a nurse, my dad was a man, her mom was a nurse, her dad was a police officer. And it's really easy for those people to define their roles and explain them to people. <laughs> uh, and it uh, it's infinitely harder if you're in digital to try to explain it. Uh, but also those org structures, a couple of things were fairly well defined. And the other thing is, is when they took time off, right, there was somebody there that would step in and do their exact job. So when they came back, everything like was back in place and they could just pick up. Mm -hmm. We know there's nothing like that in digital at this point in time right. as org structures are constantly being redefined. Roles are constantly being redefined. And... I just love to have a conversation and more than happy to share on my side as well as what's what's going on and what do I see working and what's not working, how people should think about uh, digital organization structure as a whole. And I guess the one caveat is there's no like perfect answer. And so I think as Laura and I are just chatting through this, just know that we're just telling you what we're seeing and uh, it may be working now, but not work six months from now. And so we're just trying to relay, as always, um, just help spread the word of what we see going on across the digital landscape. But Lauren, I'd love to hear what you're seeing around yeah. our structures as a whole. I mean, I totally agree. There's no silver bullet. There's no way of, hey, this is the structure you have to use. Every single organization, organization is different because every single organization's culture is different. The way their PNL is set up is different the way they have their team structure, their leaders. So there's a lot of different ways that you can slice this and be successful. I think the the number one question I get about org structure is, is should your e-commerce and or digital org sit in sales, marketing, or IT? Uh, that's the first question that I always get. And again, no perfect answer. Uh, I think there's pros and cons to both. I've seen a lot more organizations, and Aaron, I'd love to hear kind of from your perspective too. I've seen a lot of organizations move their e-commerce from marketing to sales to be more connected to the PL, to be closer to e-commerce sales and also closer to the customer. As you're thinking about e-commerce and digital being a lot more in joint business planning conversations, when people are thinking about like digital captain uh, category captaincies or incorporating that into the overall category captaincy, it gets e-commerce a little bit closer to the the sales and the conversion. But I've also seen it work really well in marketing where you're keeping the brand top of mind. You're thinking about your brand across every single channel that you're selling on and you have a really strong brand identity. I have seen it also sit in IT where they own the technology, they own the tech stack, they own the process, and they work very closely with sales and marketing in order to drive that forward. I think regardless of where it sits, every single one of those functions need to be in lockstep at all times. You need to have a business partner who's working with IT. Your IT needs to understand the business and vice versa and really have that joint conversation. And then the sales and marketing team all need to understand what is the goal at the end of the day. What are we trying to achieve? What's our overall sales goal? How is it built into our entire strategic plan for our entire organization? And that's, those are really the key things. So, so Aaron, what I try to talk about when I talk about org structure is more what's the objective rather than this box goes here and this person has this title. I, I try more to focus on like, what are the jobs that need to be done in the organization? And then you pick your poison around what that looks like from an actual org structure dotted line reporting kind of thing. Yes, interesting you bring up IT because usually the question a lot of times I get is, is it sales or marketing? Mm -hmm. uh, but just in my background, when I was kicking off e-com at Perigo, uh, we got stuck in IT. Yeah. 
uh, the plausible deniability. Um, I mean, we had a massive, I mean, we did private label for everybody that was out there. And, you know, it was such a small nugget that, oh, we'll kick this funny e-com group over. We can stick them in IT. But, you know, we grew it pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, I think it does outgrow IT in most cases that it does have to have sales and marketing. Um, at the end of the day, though, you need IT intimately integrated because there's so many tech tools and you can't operate without tech tools at this point in time. Uh, and so, you know, it's just interesting as I, as I analyze it over and over again, it's almost like you have to have an honest conversation with yourself around who's running the company. Is it a sales driven company or is it a marketing driven company? And the, if it's a sales driven company, we need to funnel it underneath sales and have everybody in line completely, obviously with marketing and IT, but if that's who's calling the shots. They need to push those projects in IT and they need to be able to have the candid conversation with the CIO to say, hey, I, I know there's 150. Pr the cool thing about being in IT was you get to see the inner workings and yeah. how underappreciated the IT groups are everywhere. Yes. And like everything they have to manage. Yeah. yeah. Well, everybody just specs, expects their computers to turn on every day, all the passwords <laughs> to work, phones to go, seamless everything, not knowing that there's 150 applications running simultaneously in the background that can't ever go down. And right. then you're, we're talking conversions and making taking everything to the cloud. We're doing all these crazy things that nobody sees. Um, but that being said, that doesn't mean that all the e-com projects need to be at the bottom. Right. They need to have a candid conversation and need to be pushed to the top um, of, of the ITQ, it, uh, you know, if relevant. But that's only going to be done by who's ever driving the org. A hundred percent agree. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's the first question I ask people. And they always laugh at me. And I'm like, no, no, I'm serious. Like, who is influential in your organization? Is it sales or is it marketing? And when they take a step back, they're like, oh, OK, it's actually marketing. And I'm like, that's where it needs to sit. I totally agree. Because who's driving the organization forward? Who's influential? Who do they listen to? That's where it needs to go. Because this digital e-commerce needs to be a part of the lifeblood of a company. I like to say it needs to be infused into the DNA. Like, it, it can't just be this side project. And I think that's what you see with the business and IT relationship. A lot of times, similar to your point, it happens in a region. Let's say you, you're, you're a global company and North America spins up e-commerce really fast at an organization that didn't have it. It gets so big, it usually gets the attention of IT. And mm -hmm. that's where IT gets involved because there needs to be some efficiencies that might need to happen around your tech stack globally or it might interfere with other integrations and there can be some rubber meeting the road. But what I would say is I'm seeing a lot more organizations move in a positive direction around that because especially with the economy that we're in right now and tightening budgets and that goes to IT sales marketing, everybody across the board, there's a lot of opportunities for everyone to work together sales, marketing, IT, to do this better, to find efficiencies, to find better technology, to save money. But I think what's challenging at larger organizations is that takes a shift in mindset where you can't use the same planning templates that you've used for the past 50 years to plan out your projects right. or the same criteria to assess which projects should be prioritized. Like I think that's the conversation that needs to happen now. Do you think people will... Ever, I mean, we're going to get to the point, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years from now, where things are a lot more seamless and coherent. And then they will totally forget what we all were going through, you know, in major, you know, you know, Fortune 1000 companies, anybody, anybody in, in publicly traded company around trying to set up e com back in the day. Like it's going to be figured out at some point in time, you know, not it's going to be figured out, but you know what I'm saying. It's like, we're going to be a best sure. practice around org structure for digital and how it fits in. Where where we sat was, you know, I, that it always thought it was funny, like Billy Bean in the movie, you know, Moneyball, is 
you know, they get to the end and they're like having that conversation with them. Well, you know, it's easy now. Like, yeah, obviously, I mean, we can see, we just use numbers and math and we can, he's like, why was it so hard? He's like, I'm the guy that ran into the brick wall <laughs> 500 times. I'm bloodied and battered. I finally break through and everybody's on the other side. Like, it's mm-hmm. super easy. Like, what was so hard about it? Like, I'm the one that ran through the brick wall. That was hard. Yeah. That, I wonder if people will kind of like forget at some point in time that. Oh, I totally think they will. I yeah. mean, look at co- COVID was the was broke the brick wall, right? Like, I mean, it accelerated us five years down the road uh, for e-commerce. And so I think a lot of people right now are like, oh, wait, I get it. It's important. I needed in my strategy when I was the one knocking down. And so were you knocking <laughs> down the, uh, or knocking on the wall. I didn't even knock down and saying like, hey, this is important. So I think we've forgotten a little bit of that. But I also think what people forget is e-commerce has only been around for like 25 years when you think about kind of when Amazon started, where brick and mortar shopping, depending on what you count as the first store, (laughs) has been around for like 300 years. So we are still very early on in in our journey and, and we're still figuring it out. And we have a lot more technology and we have a lot more learnings from other industries that can help us accelerate that. But it's still very new. So I think it's going to take more time than we'd like it to for every organization to really catch up to. Well, we're a lot less patient as a population as well, right? A thousand percent agree on that. (laughs) Why is it done already? Yeah. Right? Uh, But what's funny, I was just actually recording another podcast right before this. And we were talking about how being brilliant at the basics, like a lot of people talk about that. We talk about going back to the basics because that's the fundamentals of e-commerce. Oh, yeah. I had a whole podcast specifically on that. Just back to the basics. Hey, everybody. Everybody needs to do (laughs) that. Forget about AI and all the craziness in the metaverse. Yes. I call it shiny object syndrome. Uh, We need to get away from shiny object syndrome. But just because it's basic doesn't mean it's easy. I think people misinterpret going back to the basics that it's an easy like, hey, I've checked the box. It's really hard to do that right. It's really hard to get your process right, your measurement right, your strategy. It's just it's very challenging. And and I think that takes a lot of change in organizations that don't necessarily change quickly. Especially larger ones, right? I mean, yeah. that's the reality. But then you also get into some of the power struggle that happens between sales and marketing. And, you know, Amazon didn't really help that a whole lot. Because uh, I I know I just said, hey, it needs to go who's ever driving the organization. But Amazon is primarily a marketing arm. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no traditional, like, interaction that we would have on a sales team, right, where you would you know, talk to a buyer, you negotiate a price, you'd have an initial PO that's massive to fill stores. I mean, there's unlimited shelf space. I used to, you know, just early education when I was at Perigo with the other parts of the sales team were around like, because I would put an award in, in Salesforce, right? And it's for one case. But as soon as the awarded went through, people were like, yeah, way to go. I'm like, no, no, no. That was the hard part, right? I got you just sold one case. Now is the hard part around getting the product, the images, the A plus detail pages, you know, the the title, the bullet points. I mean, it's and now it's even more, you know, complicated. We could have videos and video reviews and posts. It's a lot more complicated, but it that's all marketing. 100%. That's all marketing. I and, completely agree. And and it also involves creative, right? So whether that's in-house and creative, whether that's an agency, a partner, whatever that looks like, that involves all of that. But I think your point is so important because it also involves pretty much every single function in an organization. So when you're thinking about org structure holistically, you can't just be like, okay, these are my e-commerce people and this is where I'm going to put them. No, no, no. What about your supply chain people that are worried about e-commerce packaging? What about your R&D people that need to be fed all of the insights from your ratings and reviews? What about your master data team who needs to set up GDSN so that you have the right barcodes on your products? I mean... There's so many different functions that I I think people take for granted that need to be involved in all of these conversations. So when you're thinking about work structure, the reason why I say, what are the jobs that need to be done or what are your objectives is because 
if one of your objectives is that you want your e-commerce sales to go from, I don't know, making this up 10% to 20% in the next three years, you can't just be like, okay, hey, five e-commerce people on my team, go do that. That's, hey, entire organization and every single function, you need to get on board and you need to understand how we're going to do this and how your role fits into this masterpiece of a painting that we're trying to create that that is e-commerce. I think that's just so, so important to remember. Do we want to tackle like retail media at all? Because this has changed the landscape as yeah. well for marketers where everybody, every retailer now wants a piece of the pie. Although it's really only Amazon and to a certain extent Walmart that seem to be really working. We can talk about Instacart, which is a little different than retail media. Um, but in my opinion, that's another whole conversation of where the data lies and everything. But like, I agree. what are your thoughts around like retail media? Because there's some major shifts in that space right now um, that, you know, it needs to be pulled in the traditional paid media budget as a whole. But there's a lot of apprehension because where is it driving the sales? Where is it not? Are we getting everybody an equal portion of the pie to drive the sales they need to drive? Talk about the buzzword of the of the year or buzzwords, retail media. I, I'm glad you brought that up. And I just did a study with Russ Derringer from Stratably. Oh, yeah. Russ is awesome. Yeah. He's awesome. If you do not subscribe to his newsletter, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, but we did a study around how retail media is affecting. And I got to have him on the podcast. That's what I got to do. You do? Yes. Yeah. That would be awesome. Uh, but we just put out a piece of research around how retail media affects organizational structures and the reason why we did that is because, to your point, there's a retail media network like every five seconds, right? At this point, I saw a stat. I think there's over 600 of them. Yeah, like Piggly Wiggly's got a retail media yes. network, right? Like, Everybody. Yeah. Like, you have you have GoPup, you have Macy's, you have Target, Walmart. Like, you have the big ones, you have the small ones. Like, everybody, to your point, wants a piece of the pie because profitability is a concern from the manufacturer and from the retailer. Everybody's trying to figure that out. But what brands are struggling with is their retail media budget is not increasing year over year. It's not like they're getting these massive additional dollars to spend. So I think the challenge for brands right now is how do I prioritize where I spend that money to actually get me the most ROI? And I think retail media is kind of where e-commerce was a couple of years ago, where it's really kind of blowing up because of what's happening in in the industry, what's happening in the world. It's a really big need for the brand manufacturers and for the retailers. There's no consistent data. There's no real consistent reporting. I know that IAB and MRC just came out with the retail media standards, which I think is a huge step forward for the industry and is very, very exciting. And I think will get us on the right path. And we're it's funny on that. We're getting IAB so uh you know, we helped uh, uh, a lot out with that whole study as a whole. So we're going to bring them on in, in a whole episode of the podcast to check that out. I mean, should I wonder if I can put it to just post it on LinkedIn because it's pretty cool. And you definitely should. Jeffrey Bustos, who who spearheaded this, is amazing. He did such a great job with it. I was at the event when they launched it and it it was just really cool to be in a room where there were brands. Was that just last week? And agencies. It was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, right. Two weeks yeah. ago, okay. yeah. But having everybody in the same room, partnering together and like working towards the same thing, I can't point to another time that I've seen in the industry that everybody really has come together to try and figure that out because I think everyone realizes if we don't do this together, no one's going to win because of those discrete amount of dollars and and how they prioritize spending them. Have you taught... Uh, did I connect you with Megan... Karun over at Clarity. We are going to connect. You did actually. So thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, that is the podcast after this one goes. Just the- Awesome. Yeah. Just a, a look forward to everybody who's listening in. That one and what she's doing to piece apart attribution to retail media. It's like- Super important. That's, that's and all data scientists, all data driven. Like, I don't know. It blew my mind. So- um I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. to listen to that one. <laughs> She's awesome and I super nice, you know, person. I'm, you know, I'm a scientist. Uh, I love data and and I love people. And she's just awesome. So good, good, That's good. Great. Let's chat with her. 
I would also say to the point about retail media, uh, I agree. Uh, figuring out how to measure it, measuring it, getting the data, that's all super critical. But if I go back to the theme of what we're talking about around org structures, your retail media needs to be on your e-commerce slash digital team. Like you need to make sure that they're connected. And that's one of the things we found in our research is that the retail media team usually doesn't sit with the digital team, which is mind blowing to me. Uh, but a lot of organizations have them completely disconnected because they're paid search versus organic. And so they're not talking to each other and they might be driving an ad to a PDP that's not fully built out and or is out of stock. And so that's wasted ad dollars. And it's a huge disconnect throughout the entire organization. So yes, figuring out attribution and, and ROI and measurement but first, you need to figure out how your org is working so you're talking to the right people and they're they're reporting to the the right leader and everyone understands that kind of full picture. You need to get that in order first because even if you figure out attribution, if you're not driving to a product that's yeah. in stock. Even in stock. <laughs> even on the platform. Very unhelpful. <laughs> and it's only going to get more complicated. That's Agreed. the reality. Um, there's a big push right now uh, in, on the paid media side for you know streaming TV ads. Uh, and it's just different than in the past where you think TV is all pretty much all on the brand side. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get into streaming ads, I mean, you're getting to performance marketing. Right. And that is completely different because you can actually drive traffic to a detail page or wherever you want, your own .com. It's completely different than traditional TV spend. And that's another thing that I've been seeing happening when you think about it is like all of this needs to get consolidated within, yes, the digital and the e-com team. So they have the visibility of what's taking place. Mm -hmm. And that's going to rub some people, especially the traditional brand side, the wrong way. But the people who are winning and streaming ads right now, are when you treat it as with a call to action, performance marketing, not branding. And that's good. That, that is really starting to take off right now. And it reminds me of, you know, Amazon, like DSP, mm -hmm. like a couple years ago, where people were just like, well, I don't know if it's worth it. And they don't realize how much low hanging fruit there is. And then they're using that as a branded play, which is fine. There's so much low hanging fruit. That you might as well go after that and make that, uh, you know, a performance marketing play as well. But agreed. Are you seeing that the spend is changing? Like, for example, for TV ads, is it still coming? Like, where is it coming from? Are you seeing that shift, like where the budget is for things like that, or is it still traditional, like trade funds? N no, yeah, I know it's coming from the performance marketing budget because it's come from the trade funds. It's come from branding budget, and it just doesn't work out. And so they almost give up on it. I just have a few brands that have started to use it and they absolutely explode. And they don't really want anybody to know about it because they want all that inventory. But we've all watched, you know, we've always, we've all streamed something and you see the same commercial over and over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. A couple of reasons for that. One is you've been targeted. Yes. Um, the other one is there's not enough people playing in space. So that mm -hmm. person keeps winning the ad over and over again where... You know, it's, you can be at a point now where you can just drive traffic and you can get it for fairly cheap, like really cheap. And then you have like the mountain platform that's self-service and they have now agencies that are being built. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Brooke Partolo at Neon Pixel built on top of mountains. So now you can have an, a an agency that comes alongside your performance marketing agency, but runs the uh, the streaming yeah. ads off of the mountain platform. It's pretty cool. Like. But would you agree that the brands who are actually winning on that have a lot of the basics in place or understand the importance cross-functionally to be able to execute on that? Oh, uh, yeah, that's yeah. exactly it, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's also interesting when we think about org structure, there's a lot of people in the middle layer that just got removed. And that's a good point. That's a really good point. And, and now you have people who are just learning from the people in the middle who really knew right? What to do, reporting to leadership. And we're like, oh, well, we don't know if we really need them. We need to trim it out because you're right. Profitability is the number one topic 
Mm -hmm. I talk to 20 to 30 brands a week. It's startup the Fortune 100 and profitability is it. Yep. Do more with less. How can we figure out being more efficient, finding overlapping spend? I mean, and I, I always tell people, like, look at your digital and look at your omni-channel process. Are you creating digital images in multiple countries that are exactly the same? Like, there's a lot of opportunities there to look across how you're creating content, how you're writing content, whether you're a global company or not. There's so much opportunity that's untapped, I think, where you can find a lot of savings. And also, if you're measuring efficiency, I talk about this a lot, you need to look at how long it's taking you to actually do all of this work. Because yes, you can automate things, but if you have no visibility to how you work today and where the pain points are or the bottlenecks are, you can't automate anything. So you really need to figure out from start to finish, does it take me 10 months to create content? Does it take me two months? Does it take me six weeks? You need to understand that first because everyone is going into this automation mode, which I think is incredible. And there's a ton of opportunity to use automation and AI to get more efficient. But if you don't understand your process, you can't automate anything, right? So I think we need to go back to how do you operate from R&D to to the sales team, what happens in between, and then figure out what are your efficiencies that you can find and and how can you plug in AI to help with that? Yeah, I mean, the, the one holdback I see to that is just time. People don't have the time to do it. That's why, you know, Declan- But do you have the time to not? I don't know, you just have a number to hit right push. now. I just, I know. <laughs> I, know Declan, I agree, I agree. Bring in Declan, that's what you gotta do. Uh, you know, the outside voice is going to tell you because the reality is you don't you don't have the time to not do it, but people don't have the time to do it right now. It's especially Q4 and then I next think. year it's going to be worse, right? Like, but priorities are starting think. to slow down. Like my my feeling right now, what I'm hearing, it, if I, but it seems like people ran out of like money uh, for buying products in like January and they switched over to credit cards. <laughs> and then sometime in July, August, they've now started to run out of credit. Yep. And so things are gonna slowly start slowing more and more. Mm-hmm. I think maybe at a slowly, I don't know, maybe it's at a faster pace where it's gonna keep slowing down, where people just have less money to spend. And now you're fighting over fewer people fewer buying, people. which means your customer acquisition costs go up. Right. Like, but are you, but I think this is where, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of research to support this in, in past recessions, whether you think we're in a recession or not. Um, there's a lot of data around this is the time to better understand your exact consumer and what they want and really make sure you're focused on them totally rather than broad strokes. Where I think, I think that's starting to resonate. That, that's what I've seen where people come to me and they're like, I don't really care about all these channels. I'm focusing on these two because that's where my consumers are. That's where I'm going to get my ROI. How can I be better at these two channels? And I have to say, I haven't seen that previously. Everybody wanted to be everywhere all the time, doing all the fun things, uh, whether it was a shiny object or not. And now it is, I'll call it radical prioritization because it is a necessity to be able to do that. Radical prioritization. I know. I'm going. I'm going with the radical. I know it's a very I like word, it. but I think no. It's the reality, right? You don't have to be everywhere, and you don't have to be spending everywhere. No, I right? agree. But there's a pressure to do so because I think one, you see your competitors doing it potentially, but I think we're we're past the time where it's like, hey, they're doing it, so I should do it. And you need to be much more strategic, where you're like, okay for my business and for my product. Do I need to do this? And really put the blinders on and look at the data. Talking about data and being a scientist, look at the data and you'll be able to figure out what you need to do and what you need to prioritize. Yeah, FOMO is not a good reason. It is not. Being on TikTok. No, but but you know, it is totally an element in how people are thinking, oh, well, this competitor is doing it, so we should do it. Especially when they're driven for growth, right? Yes. You got to grow. Add the next channel. Add the next channel. Not knowing that the next channel 
might be totally margin diluted when you incorporate all of the costs for launching it. Yes, I 100% and agree. And it operational and providing content for it. Wow. And it's a longer play, right? Like you, you need to understand your objective. Like I was I was talking to a brand the other day and, and I loved the, the digital leader said to me, she was like, before I look at any type of measurement or before I create any new strategy or even launch a new product, we sit down as a cross-functional digital steer co and we say, what is the objective? And they get so specific into that and they say, okay, why are we doing this? What is this driving? Who is our consumer? And they really kind of rip it apart before they decide to move forward. And they found that to be super helpful rather than just running and be like, hey, we need a new product or hey, we need to do this because someone else is doing it. And it's allowed them to really focus in their category and really gain so much market share because of it. So I think pausing and kind of reassessing is is a really big, important step for brands right now. Yeah. So let's recap just a few things. We don't have to wrap up, but I want to make sure from org structure, you can start in IT, but it probably shouldn't end up there. Yep. Uh, have a honest conversation of where who's actually running. Is it a sales or is it a marketing organization as a whole? And that is at least a starting point for where it should be consolidated up underneath. Um, we have to get digital. Well, if you're all Amazon focused, it's probably going to be marketing, just to be clear. Uh, that's my personal opinion, but- um, Did you go to Amazon focused? Also a question. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, when we're thinking about the, the digital and the paid digital media teams and marketing as a whole, like when you're talking retail media, it has to be looped in with the digital and the e-com teams. Um, what did we miss? Include everybody in it. Cross-functional collaboration. Yep. Um, and then, uh, prioritizing radical prioritization. Oh, you forgot my word, my oh, buzzword, radical, radical prioritization. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the other thing I'll add to that would be. Thinking about your your leadership and and how that how your team ladders up. So I don't know from your perspective. I'd love to hear what you've seen, but I've seen a lot more organizations create a role like a chief growth officer versus having like a, a CMO or a chief digital officer, and and really rethinking how functions are aligned to a leader who has more visibility cross functionally rather than the CMO having just the visibility for marketing versus the CSO having just the visibility for for uh, the sales side of things. So that's a big shift I've seen in org structures. And I think it makes sense. I think it's a powerful change, but I think it's going to take some time to be much more broadly rolled out. But I'm curious to see if... if no, I agree. I love the chief digital officer role and I would love to be a chief digital officer. Um maybe some point in time because the the only issue that came up was they're always chasing the shiny object yeah that's what happened over and over again what is the next what is the next silver bullet i'm going after and the reality is is you know um you <laughs> you can't be chasing unicorns all the time right oh no. <laughs> you gotta no, be got stuff money for that. Eat. <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually find and eat that. And uh, that's where I think the CDO role was essential at the time because it's really promoting, we have to try new things on a consistent basis. It's almost like, um, you know, like the chief scientific officer, mm -hmm. you know, like we have to be innovative. We have to trial and error. We shouldn't put down any kind of failure. We should continue to lead, but that's completely different than a growth officer who's going to be looking at, okay, what is in store versus our D2C versus Amazon. And maybe we don't have one of those oh, right now. It's huge B2B. Um, yes, I, I have agree. to do a few different B2B podcasts because everybody's realizing right now Gen Z millennials are in buyer roles. Mm -hmm. They just are. And they want, they don't, they don't want to call and talk to anybody. No. And they right? have different hours. They have different ways of, of communicating. Is it text message, emails? A hundred percent. I we totally just, agree. Yeah, and we just did a, a a dinner last night with Big Commerce and PayPal in uh, in Chicago with a group of brands, just like a think tank around what's going on, what do we need, and it is B two B, and it's B two B checkout. That's huge. That's going to be a, a game changer. Um, 
So I think there's a lot of opportunity for, so a lot of companies are B2B and B2C and those two pillars, functions, whatever are totally separate. And there's so much you can learn from each other. There's right. so much you can leverage across. The companies I've talked to that are, are B2B and B2C, sometimes I connect to them and I'm like, oh, do you know this person at your company who works? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? B-side? Like you should talk to them. So that's another connection point that it, you can learn so much. There's there's a lot of things that are very different about B2B, yes. But there's a lot of things that are very similar. And there's a lot of synergies with technology, with content, with resourcing that I think can be leveraged across the board. A hundred percent. What are you most excited about as we kind of get to the end of the, the episode here? What do you get excited about? I mean, besides Ooh. meeting new people, I right? Mean- like Everything in digital? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think the thing I'm most excited about is that a lot of organizations, especially the ones that are more digitally mature, e-commerce is finally being, and I'm going to, I'm taking this from some Profitero research that came out around org structures. It's finally being democratized into the organization. So you're not a digital marketer, you're a marketer and you know digital. And I think that is a huge step forward coming from the brand side where I was a digital, I was a digital marketer, I was a digital lead. I had to kind of fight for my space in the organization to now it being a fundamental part of how business is being done. I think that is a huge step forward. I'm so excited about that because I think it also opens up a lot of opportunities for more career pathing for those that are in digital and e-commerce where that was and still probably is a little bit challenging because they don't know where to put us, right? They're like, oh, well, if you're digital, you have to stay in digital or you have to rotate through every function or that's not how the career path works for digital leaders. And and I fundamentally believe that the future CEOs and and presidents of, of companies are going to be people who started in digital or are digitally uh, native or focused because they really understand cross-functional operations. They can ladder between strategy and tactics really quickly. So I'm just really excited to see that shift and excited to see it continue to grow because it's finally recognized as such an important it's awesome. business. It's awesome. It is. I, I totally agree. I know we could talk for hours about it, but that that is what I'm most excited about. What are you excited about? I'm throwing a bet. I am excited. What am I excited about? I am... I'm excited uh, at all the actual new tools. So the cool thing about the pandemic it was this focus on digital and then the growth in digital fueled a lot of funding into digital. And that's great from new tech popping up. The downside was the money was spread across, you know, 100,000 different new startups. Mm-hmm. Um, any of them could have made it or not made it, but a lot of them didn't because they couldn't quite get the next round or they weren't good enough, but there were so many for people to actually choose and vet out that they just wouldn't do it, right? Um, And so now as that money has slowed down a little bit, what we've gotten is um, there's a a weeding out of the chaff and we've got some really cool new tech and uh, uh, companies that are going to enable digital growth. The stuff that they're going to be able to do because now the money is going to be consolidated with them and they need investment. These are sometimes, you know, pre-revenue, pre-profit, you know, they might be series A, pre-series B, but they've got something that's awesome. And I love um, new tech um, that make that makes sense, not just random stuff, but the right. new tech that's going to make uh, digital uh, executives' lives easier. And now uh, there's a lot of it that's just going away. And the stuff that's left is the stuff that is going to be profitable and there's money's going to pour in. In the next two years, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so different three years from now. You know, you know, it's, you know, it's just going to be like talking to my parents, like pre microwave times, right? Like, it's going to be so different. People are going to barely even remember, yeah. right? My kids in landlines, right? Yes. AOL. Then, like, with this corded yeah. phone. Yeah. Right? It's going to Floppy be so disc. different. We could keep going. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be. <laughs> I agree. Nice. But yeah. I, I, I love that point because I think 
if, if we go back to the kind of resourcing and org structure, you're adding more channels, you're adding more SKUs, you're not going to infinitely add more people. Yes. It's just not possible. Y- you cannot continue to add more resources. So it is fantastic that we now have the capability that can do more with less and can automate things and can actually move us forward because it's just not sustainable to add 15 more people every time there's every a new time retail around. media network or whatever the new thing is. So I think I agree. It will fundamentally change. the industry. It's going to be awesome too. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, I agree. Not as fun as this podcast has been though. I um, also agree with that. This was great. Thanks for anytime. having me. Uh, we do have to work on the one we we're talking about where we're going to have people submit, right? And then yes, we'll Q and A's questions out of the fishbowl and answer them real time. Yeah, so get your questions ready, everyone yeah. who's listening. We're yeah. ready to answer them. Yeah. Well, Lauren, this has been absolutely fantastic, uh, and thanks again for jumping on. And with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode of the Digital Deep Dive. Thanks everybody for listening in. <laughs>